Father in heaven, we know that you are the only one who is worthy of our praise. Lord, you have demonstrated that in all of your creation. Lord, you have given us your word that tells us that you are worthy of our praise. Lord, I pray that after we spend time in your word tonight, we would see more clearly just how worthy you are of our praise. Lord, I pray that you would attend to us and give us your spirit that we might understand your word and then grant us your spirit that we might understand that truth and apply that truth to our lives. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Ezekiel, please? We are working our way through the 66 books of the Bible. And this evening, we're going to be tackling 48 chapters of Ezekiel. So we'll see how that goes. Um, Thank you for coming this evening. It's a blessing to my heart to see so many of you here, eager to hear God's Word. Before we get to the study of Ezekiel, it's important to understand why we have this book. And there are two very prominent themes in this book as we go through this book. And those are God's glory and God's presence. And we think for a minute about what we know about the testimony that God has given to us. We just sang about many of these things ourselves in creation. There's the world that we see before us. We see mountains and rivers and clouds and oceans and glaciers. All of them existing together in perfect harmony. And yet we do nothing to sustain any of it or cause any of it. And then there's the universe that's above us. We see an uncountable blanket of stars above us each one having their own position, velocity, mass, smell, temperature, pressure. And again, we do nothing to cause or sustain that. That is God's testimony to us. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanses declaring the work of His hands. Day to day brings forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. All of this points to one central fact that we want to remember tonight and that God is glorious and He is impressive And he is without peer in all of his majesty and his wisdom and his power. And because of that, he is worthy of our worship. God had a design for Old Testament Israel, and that is that they would be a light to the nations around them. Isaiah 49, verse 6, I will also make you, Israel, a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God's design for Israel was that they would put his glory on display at a human level to all the nations around them. They would be different from all the other nations because they would have one God, the God, the God of the Bible. And they would interact with that God through obedience to his word. And in their interactions with God, they would show the nations around them the rightness and the goodness of a submissive relationship to a holy God. And that is an exceedingly high privilege. But by the time we get to Ezekiel, Israel had been in the promised land for 800 years, and they had been unfaithful to God just about that whole time, and they had failed at their task of being a light to the nations. Jeremiah 32 helps us understand just how badly they had failed. Jeremiah writes about Israel. They came in and took possession of the land, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. That's Jeremiah 32, 23. Ezekiel is written to give us God's response to this. It's the just response of a holy God to a people that God has been faithful to, but have been unfaithful to him, despite his mercy and his kindness to them. And as we go through this, we're going to see God's response in three different ways. We're going to see God's departure from Judah, and we're going to see that in the first 24 chapters of the book. We're going to see God's judgment of the nations around Judah in the next section of the book. And then at the end, we're going to see God's restoration of Israel. Before we go too far, we need to look into the authorship of the book, and we notice that the introduction to Ezekiel is very brief. It doesn't tell us much about our author other than he was a priest who was living in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. Ezekiel 1.3, the word of Yahweh came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. The fact that God chose a priest to write this book is really significant because it would take a man with a comprehensive understanding of the law to be able to explain to Israel just how unfaithful they had been to God. Ezekiel was written during the exile in Babylon, and much of it was written to the Jews who were still back in Jerusalem between the second and third deportations, and we'll get to that in a second. But Ezekiel wrote from Babylon in captivity. 
So what we're going to do is take a quick look at the kings of Israel and understand which of those were contemporary to Ezekiel. And Josiah was the last of Israel's good kings, and he served and he ruled from 640 to 609 B.C. And then the next four kings were one after another horrible kings. Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and then Zedekiah at the very end. And to understand how Ezekiel's prophecy fits in with all the deportations, we need to get our mind around those as well. There were three separate deportations from Jerusalem to Babylon, and the first was in 605 B.C., and the second was in 597 or so B.C., and that's when Ezekiel himself was deported. And then he started prophesying about four years after that in 593 B.C., the third deportation took place in 586 B.C., and his final prophecy was in about 573 B.C. A lot of dates, but the time span over which Ezekiel prophesied was about 20 years. And it started during the reign of Zedekiah, the last king, and that it ended about halfway through the exile. So that's a little bit of background. Let's talk about God's departure from Judah and as we look at God's departure from Judah, we want to understand three things and keep these three things in view. And the first is the issue of God's glory. And that's foundational for the rest of the book, the whole book. Then we want to look at God's prophet, Ezekiel himself, and understand exactly what it was that God commissioned him to do. And then we're going to take a look at God's judgment. And all of that will give us a good picture of God's departure from Judah. As we look into the issue of God's glory, we find that visions play a very prominent role in the book of Ezekiel. And in general, these visions serve to point out some aspect of God's relationship with Israel. And the first vision we find in chapter 1, and it starts in verse 4, and it's a vision of a chariot. And Ezekiel sees a storm wind coming from the north, and it's a cloud with fire. In verse 5, he sees four living beings within this fire. In verse 6, he notices that each one of these living beings has four faces and four wings. They have straight legs in verse 7. And there are human hands underneath the wings in verse 8. But then he notices in verse 10 that these faces appear to be on different sides of their heads. And there are four different faces. There's the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of a bull, and the face of an eagle. And this is very, very similar to the four living creatures that we see in Revelation chapter 4. These beings, in verse 12, go wherever the Spirit was about to go, and they move in perfect harmony and coordination with one another. In verse 15, we see that each being also has two wheels associated with them, and those wheels are perpendicular to one another, and they move independent of one another. So verse 17 tells us that the wheels can move in any direction without turning. And so what all of this gives us a picture of is some very unrestrained motion. There's unrestrained motion that's moving around here. But that's the, the first vision, but it doesn't stand on its own. It has to be taken with the vision that God gives Ezekiel right after that, starting in verse 22. And Ezekiel sees an expanse above these living beings. So there's four living beings, and there's an expanse above it, like crystal. And above that expanse was a sapphire in experience, an appearance. So there's a, a color of deep blue. In verse 26, high above the throne was that which resembled a man. So he sees the semblance of a man. And verse 27 tells us something very interesting and very compelling about this man. He's glowing metal from the loins up, and he's fire from the loins down. And in verse 28, Ezekiel tells us exactly what he sees. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, of the Lord. So... The man that he sees in verse 26 is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. So Ezekiel sees an expanse with a throne and it's sapphire in appearance. The second vision is all about the presence of God and the first vision is all about unrestrained motion. And so when you take those two things together, you see the idea that God's presence is unrestrained in its movement, its motion, its location. It will extend over all the earth. And that's the starting point for the book of Israel is God's unhindered, unrestrained presence. He can put it wherever he wishes. We know from the Old Testament narrative that God chose Israel to be a nation unto him, and he gave them land. And in that land, he gave them a design for the temple, and then he gave them a king who would build that temple. 
And then he chose to put his presence dwelling in that temple among the people. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 11, the glory of Yahweh filled the house of the Lord. God said, my presence may dwell any place I choose, and I am choosing to put my presence on display in Israel. So in chapter 2, we get the chance to see a picture of how well Judah was reflecting that glory to the nations. And we see God's call on Ezekiel in that chapter. And we see how God enlists Ezekiel in, into his service. Now, Ezekiel was already a priest, but now God has a specific speaking task for him to perform. So he becomes a prophet. In chapter 3, God says, I am sending you to the sons of Israel. And this is part, very important for us to understand. They are a rebellious people. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord Yahweh. In verse 6, he has two instructions that relate to fear. He says, you shall not fear them, and you shall not fear their voice or their words. Instead, in verse 7, you speak my words to them. My words are authoritative. You give them my words. And in verse 9, a hand is extended to Ezekiel, and a scroll was in that hand. And written on that scroll were lamentations and mourning and woe, in verse 10. We move into chapter 3, and God commands Ezekiel to eat the scroll. Feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll, verse 3. So Ezekiel eats it, and he finds that it was sweet as honey. Now, normally, lamentations and mourning and woe are a very bitter experience. But this is a sweet taste for Ezekiel. What this helps us understand is that Ezekiel is coming in line with God's design for his judgment of Israel. God says in verse 17, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman from the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. That's what Ezekiel is to do. He is to warn them. Verses 26 and 27 give us more detail on that. God says, I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be mute and cannot be a man who rebukes them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I will open your mouth and you will say to them, thus says the Lord Yahweh. So God says to Ezekiel, I want you to warn them, but I'm going to make you mute and you cannot speak unless I speak to you. And when you speak to them, you will speak exactly what I give you to speak to them. So then the, move, the book moves on to cover God's judgment of Israel um, in chapters uh, 4 through 24. And what God does is he gives us in this section the reasons for the judgment and he gives us details about the judgment itself. And again, most of this is directly at the remnant who remained in the promised land after the second deportation. The first and the second deportations had taken place and, and those Jews were already in Babylon and they were deported they were sinful people, and that's why they got deported. But they were participating in God's design, at least at a surface level, that they would go to Babylon, they would be restored, they would be sustained, they would be strengthened. Seventy years later, they would come back. But the remnant, those who had not gone in the first two deportations, were still in the Promised Land. They were still in Jerusalem, and God's judgment was aimed primarily at them. The first thing we want to notice in chapter 4 is the certainty of God's judgment. We see that in verses 1 through 8. God tells Ezekiel to go get a brick and write the word Jerusalem on that brick and lay siege to that brick and then put an iron plate between himself and the city representing the certainty of the siege that it cannot be stopped. God tells Ezekiel in verse 7, set your face towards that siege and bear your arm. That says that God's judgment is about to begin. And then God puts ropes on Ezekiel so that he can't move. And this signifies that there is nothing that Jerusalem can do to stop this that is coming. So the first thing that Israel needs to understand about this judgment that's coming is that it is coming. The second thing they need to understand is that this judgment is coming because they are an unclean people. And we see that in verses 9 through 17. God commands Ezekiel in verse 9 to make bread. Drop down to verse 12. And God tells him, you shall eat it as barley cake, having baked it over human dung. And this, in verse 13, declares the uncleanness of Israel after God banishes them. So not only does Israel know that judgment is coming for them, but they know that it's coming because they're unclean. We enter into chapter 8, and we see a series of visions that God is giving to his judgment of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
And before we start this, we need to understand the authority that is behind all of these visions and understand that that authority is from God himself. So in verse 2 of chapter 8, Ezekiel says, Then I looked, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of a man. From his loins and downward there was the appearance of fire. From his loins upward the appearance of brightness, the appearance of glowing metal. From the loins down there's fire, and from the loins up there's glowing metal. This is very, very similar to what we saw in chapter 1, where Ezekiel sees God's presence. The same God that Ezekiel saw in chapter 1, he sees again here. This tells us that the authority in these visions is from God. So we see there that his spirit is taken to Jerusalem in verse 3. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So Ezekiel's spirit is taken to Jerusalem. His body remains in Babylon, but his spirit is back in Jerusalem. I want us to flip ahead for a minute, and we're going to jump back to chapter 8, but... Jump ahead to chapter 11, verse 24. And what we're going to see is the end of these visions. And we're going to see what happens to Ezekiel's spirit that was in Jerusalem. Ezekiel 11:24. The spirit lifted me up and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God to the exiles in Chaldea. So the vision that I had seen left me. This is Ezekiel's spirit returning to Babylon, Chaldeans, from Jerusalem. So we know that everything that takes place between Chapter 8 and chapter 11 is Jerusalem. Ezekiel's spirit is in Jerusalem, and these are visions that are from God. All of these things, again, relate to one thing, and that is God's judgment of Israel. And we start that seeing the first vision in chapter 8. And what we see here is the way that the Jews had abominations in the temple. They had set up abominations. And in the first vision, what Ezekiel is going to see is that he gets closer and closer to the center of the temple. The sin gets worse and worse and worse. Starts in verse 5 at the entrance to the north altar gate, and Judah is provoking God's jealousy. In verse 6, God tells Ezekiel, you will see greater abominations. Verse 7, he changes locations to the entrance to the court. In verse 10, he sees detestable things that are carved in the wall. In verse 11, 70 elders are offering incense to their idols, saying, Yahweh does not see us. These are elders. In verse 12, God tells Ezekiel, you will see greater abominations. Verse 14, third location, entrance to the gate of the Lord's house, Yahweh's house. There's women weeping for Tammuz. This is the God of fertility. They know that God is the giver of life. They know that God is the one who promised them that if you obey me in the promised land, you will not have barren wombs. You can trust me. If you obey me, in addition to everything else I will give you to be prosperous, you will not have barren wombs there. But they're weeping to a God of fertility. God says again in verse 14, you will see greater abominations. In verse 16, they go to the inner court of Yahweh's house. There's 25 men and their backs are to the temple and they're facing the east and they're prostrating themselves to the sun. They're worshiping the created thing rather than the creator of those things. In chapter 9, Ezekiel sees another vision and this vision relates to the slaughter of Jerusalem. In verse 2, there's six men and each of them has a shattering weapon in his hand. And then there's another man and he's clothed in linen and he has a writing instrument. And this man is to go throughout Jerusalem and he is to put on a mark on people but there's a certain group of people that he's to put that mark on and it's all of the people who sigh and are grieved by the abominations that are in jerusalem the other six men are to slay everybody else who doesn't have that mark we see in verse five that that includes old men young men maidens little children women and in verse six god says start with my sanctuary that tells you that the leadership in the sanctuary the people who are worshiping in the sanctuary there are abominations everywhere In chapter 10, we see that God's glory is going to depart from the temple. God had seen all that is taking place. He'd seen these abominations. He'd seen the uncleanness. And he says, I am going to depart. I've had enough. Verse 18, the glory of Yahweh departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And we're going to see that God's glory moves from where it was originally in stages. So that's the first stage his departure from Israel. His presence is no longer in the Holy of Holies. Chapter 11, there's judgment on the wicked leadership. And the reason why is because the leadership rejected God's design for the exile. In chapter 
11, verse 1, Ezekiel sees 25 men at the entrance to the east gate of Yahweh's house. These are most likely elders, and they are giving evil advice in Jerusalem. In verse 3, we see their message. Their message is, let's build houses. Let's prosper here. Jerusalem is the pot, and we're the flesh. What they're really saying is, let's ignore Ezekiel's instructions. Let's ignore his message. Jerusalem is as safe as meat in the pot. We are good here. God's design for Israel was go with the Babylonians in, into the Babylonians into exile, prosper in Babylon, and then return 70 years later. But they're saying, no, no, let's stay here. Let's prosper here. God tells them in verse 7 what they've done. And God says, Jerusalem actually is not safe. The reason why it's not safe is because you have slain godly people, innocent people, and you should have believed their message. In verse 10, God says, you think that this is a safe place? Well, I will drive you out from what you believe to be a safe place, and I will judge you at the border of Israel. And why does he say that? So that you will know that I am Yahweh. So Jerusalem is in line for a severe judgment. We see that in verse 22. The glory of Yahweh went up from the midst of the city, and it stood over the mountain which is east of the city. So first it leaves the Holy of Holies. Now it's standing outside of Jerusalem. In chapter 12, we see after his spirit returns to Babylon, Ezekiel prophesies about Zedekiah's failed escape. And again, Zedekiah is the last one of the kings. And he is the one who is promoting the idea of staying here. God tells Ezekiel, Zedekiah will load his baggage in chapter 12, verse 12. And in the dark, he will go out. He will dig a hole through the wall to bring it out. So Ezekiel knows that Zedekiah is going to escape through a hole in the wall at night in the dark. But God says in verse 13, and he shows how clearly God is in command here. And we know he's using the Babylonians, but we know that this is God working through the Babylonians because he says, I will also spread my net over him and he will be caught in my snare and I will bring him to Babylon in the land of Chaldeans, yet he will not see it. It's because Nebuchadnezzar is going to gouge his eyes out before they leave and upon arrival, he will bring Zedekiah blind to Babylon. The last main reason we want to see why God is judging Israel and judging Jerusalem in particular is because they have false prophets, and we see that in chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 6, God is referring specifically to the false prophets. This was a rampant problem in Israel. It was so bad that Isaiah talks about it, Jeremiah talks about it, Ezekiel talks about it. Ezekiel and Jeremiah were contemporary to one another. Their ministries overlapped. So, of course, they're going to talk about the same thing. Verse 6, these prophets see falsehood and lying divination who are saying, Yahweh declares, when Yahweh has not sent them, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. So the prophets are saying, Yahweh declares, and then they make up their own peace, and they hope that it comes to pass. God says in verse 10, it is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace. Again, this is the period between the second and third deportations. God is preparing Nebuchadnezzar to burn the city and take the people away, and the prophets are prophesying peace. They're deliberately misleading Israel with words that did not originate from God. So there are many, many reasons why God is going to judge Jerusalem and why he is going to remove his presence, but... A reasonable summary is that they're an unclean people and they have defiled God's temple and they have rejected his design for the exile and they have wicked false prophets throughout. We're going to look at the last chapter um, in this section and that's chapter 23. And this has to deal with the, the sin of Israel and Judah together. And these are some of the saddest chapters you can read in your Bible, some of the saddest verses. And, and God helps Ezekiel understand this and put it in front of the people by telling them a story of two sisters. The older sister is Ohola, and she represents the northern kingdom or Samaria. The younger sister is Oholaba, and she represents the southern kingdom, Jerusalem in particular. In verse 3, we see that for both of them, their sin and their idolatry started in Egypt while they were in slavery in Egypt, before the exodus, through, before the wilderness, before the conquest, 
they brought their idols in. They had their idols with them the whole time. In verses 5 through 10, you see the behavior of the northern kingdom. They lusted after the Assyrians. And this description is graphic. Literally, Samaria defiled themselves with the Assyrians. But you read about Jerusalem's idolatry in verses 11 through 21. Oholaba was more corrupt than her older sister. And the details of that are given through verse 21. And it is even more carnal, it is more prurient than Samaria's was. And the end of this passage is about the most graphic, obscene, vulgar explanation of behavior in all of Scripture. And the reason why God uses that behavior and that language is because only this kind of language can accurately represent the depth of Israel's harlotry before God, both physically and spiritually. God says in chapter 23, verse 30, these things will be done to you because you have played the harlot with the nations, because you have defiled yourself with their idols. This is the depth, it's the absolute deepest point of Israel's harlotry before God. It's worse than when they were in Egypt in slavery. It's worse than when they were in the wilderness. It's worse than when they were under the judges. It's worse than the Northern Kingdom. There was no other period in Israel's history where their harlotry was displayed to this extent, which is why we find what we do in the very next chapter. Chapter 24, these events take place in the ninth year after the second deportation. It's about 586 BC. Verse two, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. In verse 13, God has a message for Jerusalem. In your filthiness is lewdness that you are not clean. You will be cleansed from your filthiness again. I'm sorry, you will not be cleansed from your filthiness again until I have spent my wrath on you. You think about that. Nothing will prevent the outpouring of God's wrath on them until it is done. God is saying, I made you a people. I gave you a land. I gave you a temple. My presence was with you in that temple. And you rejected me and you defiled my temple. And you did that for centuries. And it got worse and worse and worse as it went along. So God's judgment of Judah is just and it's deserved and is in keeping with his holy character. And it's good for us to stop and consider a couple of application questions for ourselves here. And remember Jeremiah's observation at the beginning that I mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 32. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. A question for us. Do I demonstrate my love for God by obeying his commands? In this church, we try to keep Psalm 19 in front of us quite often. Verse 8 says, The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The judgments of God are true. They are righteous altogether. They're more desirable than gold, than much fine gold, and they're sweeter than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. We have to ask ourselves, are God's ways desirable, sweet, attractive to us? Or do we consider it a task? Secondly, how does my zeal for God's word and obedience to his word influence my effectiveness as Christ's ambassador today? But Judah won't be the only one to feel God's judgment. God's judgment is presented among the remaining nations in chapters 25 to 32. Instead of walking through each one of those in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize God's judgment of these nations in two ways. Uh, God has judgment against them for two reasons. And first is because every one of these nations acted hatefully towards Israel at some time in their past. And they brought harm to Israel. And secondly, God is pouring out his judgment on them because he is proving to those nations that he remains sovereign even while his people are in exile. So in chapter 25, you have the judgment of four nations. You have Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistia. And in every one of those, you see God saying, so that they will know that I am Yahweh, so that they will know my vengeance. They will know my vengeance upon them again and again and again. Chapters 26 through 28, you see God's judgment against one nation, and that's Tyre. And it's because of their pride. And it's because of the way they viewed Israel. In verse 2 of 26, this is what God says concerning Jerusalem, what Tyre said concerning Jerusalem. They said, aha, the gateway of the peoples is broken. It is open to me. I shall be filled. 
they thought it was their privilege to go in and take whatever they wanted from the promised land. And they were full of pride and arrogance. In 27.3, you see that Tyre has said, I am perfect in beauty. I am perfect in beauty. 28.2, uh, you see that Tyre has said, I am a God. In 26.6, God again says, they will know that I am Yahweh. That's why I'm bringing my judgment. Chapters 29 through 31, you see the judgment on another country, and that's Egypt, and it's the same thing, pride. We all know what Egypt did to Israel when they were in slavery for 400 years. They did much more than that. In chapter 29, verse 3, you see the pride of Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, my Nile is mine, and I myself have made it. He's elevating himself above God. God's judgment is in verses 15 and following, he says, I will make Egypt so small that they will not rule over the nations. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. When you read these chapters, you find that, that God says nothing to them about restoring these nations. He says nothing about them and their land being restored or the people being restored or the worship being restored. He's just going to judge them. But Israel is different. This is what God says in Exodus chapter 7, verse 6. I will take you for my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God. Personal possession, personal pronouns. My people, your God. God has a unique covenant relationship with Israel that compels him to restore them, and that's what we see in chapters 33 through 48. We see God restoring these people that he has a covenant relationship with. But the first thing God does in chapter 33 is he establishes his merciful character and he issues a call to repentance. God shows that there is a causal relationship between ongoing sin on one hand and physical death on the other. In this season of Israel's history, ongoing sin will bring death and turning from sin will preserve your life. Your physical life will be preserved. And it's only through a preserved life that a man can turn to God and believe the message of salvation. In verse 11, you see God says to Ezekiel, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his evil way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? God is merciful, and he is saying, Turn from your sin, and I will spare your life. So God's heart is to save, and he demonstrates that with a restoration that covers several areas. And the first thing he needs to do is restore good, holy leadership. Restoring Israel involves getting holy leadership into Israel. And that means getting rid of worthless leadership and replacing them with the only holy leadership there is, and that's God himself. In verse 2, we read the priests have been feeding themselves. They're not caring for the flock. They're feeding themselves. They've eaten the fat and clothed themselves in verse 3. In verse 4, we see what they haven't done. They haven't strengthened the sickly. They haven't sought for the lost. Instead, what they've done is they have dominated them with force and severity. God says, my flock has become a prey. The leadership of the country is actually preying on his people. Verse 10, says, God says, behold, I am against the shepherd. I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. So God's response in verse 10 is to demand his sheep from the worthless shepherds. God will search for his sheep and he will care for them. In verse 13, he said, I will bring the peoples out and I will gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. I will feed them in a good pasture. So God is going to get the worthless shepherds out of the land. And in chapter 36, he restores the land. The land itself is going to be restored. Let's jump ahead to verse 8. We're going to read verses 8, 9, and 12, and we'll see God's heart for the land itself. We need to understand this, that, that the land is going to be destroyed and ravaged, and God needs to restore that. So he says, But you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, and they will soon come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you will be cultivated and sown. Again, God's speaking of the land itself here. Yes, I will cause men, my people Israel, to walk on you and to possess you. 
So God is going to reverse the curse on the land. It will be a beautiful, fruitful, abundant land. But there's something else God needs to do before he restores the people, and that is that he needs to restore his reputation. His primary concern is here is for his own holy name. And God's going to describe what happened to his holy name when he, uh, the nations were scattered into the other lands. And we see that in verse 20. When they, Israel, came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of Yahweh, yet they have come out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. In verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. God is exceedingly concerned about his holy name, his glory, his reputation. Verses 24 through 29 and then 33, we see what God does for Israel personally. He says, I will take you from the nations. I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you from all your unfilthiness. 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. So I'm going to clean you on the outside and I'm going to give you a new heart on the inside. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and I will save you from all your uncleanness. In verse 33, back to the land, I will cause the cities to be inhabited. And again, God reiterates in verse 32 why he's doing this. I'm not doing this for your sake, declares Yahweh. In verse 36, then the nations will know that I, Yahweh, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, Yahweh, have spoken and will do it. So God's primary concern in chapter 6 is that the nations know what he has done. They know that everything that takes place with the restoration of the land and the people is because of God. And in verse 30, or chapter 37, you see the details of that at a national level, there is spiritual restoration to Israel. Verse 1, Yahweh brings Ezekiel out by the Spirit to a valley full of bones. In verse 29, or sorry, verse 2, we see that there are many, many bones, and their bones are very dry. And what this does is this represents the spiritual deadness and lifelessness in Israel. Yahweh tells us in verse 5, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. Verse 6, I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come to life, and you will know that I am Yahweh. So this is the spiritual regeneration of future Israel that God is speaking of here, an Israel that is physically alive. So in verse 7, Ezekiel describes what he sees and what he hears. A rattling noise, bones coming together, bone to bone. Sinews are on the bones, but there's no breath in them. And then God commands Ezekiel to command the breath to come from the four winds and breathe on the slain. So Ezekiel does that in verse 10, and they come to life. God says, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land. Then you will know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and when you come to life, I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, Yahweh, have spoken and done it. Every single step in the spiritual restoration and regeneration of Israel is from God. Then what we're going to see in chapters 38 and chapters 39 is that God is going to restore peace in Israel. Israel has an awful lot of enemies, and God is going to restore, restore their peace. And it describes what God does to all the unregenerate on the earth when they array themselves against Israel and against the holy city of Jerusalem. Verse 8, the nations are summoned to Jerusalem. So the nations believe they're moving towards Jerusalem of their own accord and of their own will, but God is actually summoning them there. Verse 10, the nations will have thoughts about going up against Jerusalem. They'll have in their own mind, here's what I'll do. I'll attack Jerusalem. And they'll do so to capture it. 
But in verse 18, God's zeal and God's wrath are the cause of what is coming next. There's massive, massive destruction on those people in verses 19 through 21. God says in verse 22, with pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment and I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain with hailstone, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, I will sanctify myself and make myself known in the sight of many nations and they will know that I am Yahweh. So God himself is going to destroy all of those who are arrayed against Jerusalem so that they can live in their nation in peace. You see that? all throughout chapters 38 and 39. Chapters 40 through 43, God talks about restoring his temple. And these are some of the most important chapters in the book. There are an awful lot of details in the temple. And we can talk about Israel's offense against a holy God. We can talk about God withdrawing his presence from Israel. We can talk about God judging the foreign nations. But these give us the details of what God is aiming at, what is going to come after all of that. This was written in 573 B.C., and it's the last of God's messages to Israel through Ezekiel. In chapters 40 through 43, we see exactly what God says. He says, this is my new temple. And God is very specific about the dimensions and the contents and the construction of this place in which he will dwell with them. This new temple is going to contain an outer court. It's going to contain an inner court, a holy place, a most holy place, And there are all kinds of supporting rooms all around it. Chambers for the serving priests and chambers for storage. And there are different entrances that you must come in and exit from. God is saying, I am Yahweh and I will put my presence within your midst and the temple will be as I design it. And you will worship me and you will offer sacrifices to me according to my design. So the first thing that God does is he sets up the structure of the temple And then in the following chapters, in 44 through 46, God describes what new worship looks like for these people. These chapters detail the offerings that will be made by Israel in this time, after God has restored them. Now, these offerings don't save, just like offerings in the Old Testament did not save. But these offerings point backwards to Christ and the work that he did and performed to save all of those who would place their trust in him. So you have a future Israel making offers Offerings that point back to Christ. That's pretty exciting. And God reserves these sacrifices for the sons of Zadok. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 or chapter 6. You see that the sons of Zadok remained faithful. And so God is giving those men and those men only the privilege of offering these sacrifices, of these offerings. In chapter 45, verse 15, you see that there's a grain offering and a burnt offering and a peace offering and a drink offering. In chapter 46, there's a description of these offerings. There's regulations relating to the numbers of the lambs and the bulls and the rams and the oil for each one of these offerings. And there's regulations about which entrance they come into through and which exit they leave from. And there's rooms that are used for boiling and preparing the offerings. In all of this, God is saying, you will worship me because you are my people, but you will worship me according to my design. And then in chapters 47 and 48, God has a description of the reallocated land. The land needs to be reallocated because the land as it exists today is not set up for worship of God. Jesus' millennial kingdom is, is not only to be characterized by God's restored presence, but a restored land. And in uh, chapter 47, we see something very significant that's happening. There is water that is flowing out from the temple. And the water is flowing out and it flows to the east. And as you read your way through chapter 47, you find that the water is getting deeper with increasing distance from the temple. And that's usually the reverse of the way that rivers work. Normally when a river flows, it eventually dries up. Here the river is getting stronger and stronger and stronger with increasing distance from the temple. When you read about God's judgments in the book of Revelation, you see that there are three series of judgments. There's the sealed judgments, and then there's the trumpet judgments, and then there's the bowl judgments. And in the trumpet judgments, one of the things that takes place in the second of those judgments is that the creatures of the sea, one-third of them, die. What we see here is that the rivers are fresh. 
and they're bringing life. When you read verse 9 in chapter 47, it says, it will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. And there will be very many fish, for these waters go there and the others become fresh, so that everything will live wherever the river goes. It will be very, very clear that God is the giver of life. God is the sustainer of, sustainer of life. God is the one who restores that which is dead. God will reverse the curse and the earth will be full of life and blessing to those who live in it. That is God's testimony of his rightness to rule and reign over this earth. In chapter 48, you see the allocation of the land. Not only is the land divided among the tribes, but you also see there are allotments for other groups as well. In verses 8 through 9, you see that there is land allotted to the Lord himself. In 10 through 14, there is an allotment for the Levites. This is very, very important because these are the people who are going to lead Israel in worship of Christ and worship of God. There's an allotment in verses 15 through 20 for the common use of the city. In verses 21 and 22, there's a portion for the prince. 23 through 29 has an allotment for other ones of the tribes, Benjamin, Simeon, Zebulun, Gad. The tribes are going to be there. They will be representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And so God is thoughtful. He has this land. The land is going to be reallocated. It's going to be recharacterized. It's going to be restored so that proper worship can take place. So when we summarize this book, we can say it by this. God has judged Israel because of its harlotry against him. But he also judged the nations that mistreated Israel and believed that he was a defeated God. But one day, God will restore the promised land, and then he will restore his people to that land. And in that day, there will be a new worship by a purified people living in a right relationship with their God. For us, for believers, there will be a resurrection unto new life, eternal life, with resurrection glorified bodies that will not die, that will be beyond the reach of death and sin, and the encouragement for us tonight is we must look forward to that age. And the way we do that is by living holy lives here today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given it to us so that we can understand you. And Lord, in the pages of your scripture, you prove to us that you are a God who judges sin. And Lord, you are not partial in your judging of that sin. But Lord God, you explain to us very clearly that you are a merciful God. And in your holiness, you restore people to yourself. We are so thankful, Lord, that you gave us your son, who through his atoning sacrifice on that cross, you made him able to atone for the sin of all of those who would look to him and put their trust in him. Lord, I pray for us that we would be a people who are encouraged by this book, we would be a people who run hard after holiness of life so that we can be good ambassadors for you to this world around us. Lord, we long for the day when we will reside forever with your son. Oh Lord, we beg you and we plead with you to attend to us by your grace until that time. In Christ's name, amen.